I have been running this channel for four years, created over 100 videos and none of the projects I featured were IoT projects. Scrap that. Two years ago, I didn't even know what IoT abbreviation meant. So for boomers like myself, IoT stands for Internet of Things. IoT projects focus on connecting everyday objects to the Internet, enabling remote monitoring and control. In this video, I'll explore Wi-Fi capabilities of my Arduino Revision 4 Wi-Fi board, attempting to control LED lights from a web browser, creating a cool lamp in a process. If this is your type of thing, stick around. Let's take a look at connecting the Arduino Revision 4 Wi-Fi board to the internet. Here is the microcontroller and here is the TP-Link mesh device I use as an access point at home. We can establish this connection without any additional modules thanks to ESP32-S3 microcontroller on board. Arduino seeks to establish a connection with the access point and upon successful connection by the TP-Link device, the Arduino microcontroller is assigned an IP address associated with its MAC address through DHCP, Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol. At this moment, I will write my first IoT sketch. It's not going to be rocket science. I will establish an internet connection and then display a few key details describing that connection in the serial monitor. These details include the access point name, the IP address assigned to Arduino, signal strength, encryption type, and the MAC addresses of both devices. Both the router and Arduino with IP addresses from the same subnet are within my home local area network. The IP address pool provides 254 addresses to be assigned apart from the one for the router. Therefore, we can connect other devices to this network, such as smartphones or laptops, and assign them with IP addresses from the same pool. They will also be able to communicate with the Arduino. They can both send and receive data from it. We begin by including the necessary library to work with ESP32-S3. Next, we provide the credentials required to connect to the router including the access point ID and network password. In the setup function, we initialize the serial monitor. Then, we initiate the Wi-Fi connection using the provided credentials with the Wi-Fi begin function. Within the while loop, we continuously check for the WL connected flag, which indicates that the connection has been successfully established. Only when this flag is set do we proceed with the rest of the code. We can leave the loop function empty. Let's take a look at the code required to display the connection details. We will start with the SSID of the network, followed by the IP address assigned to Arduino, signal strength and encryption type. To display MAC addresses, we need an additional function to convert them into string format. Here is a sample MAC address. In Arduino, it is represented by a table of bytes. The function takes this table of bytes and constructs a string from it. The for loop iterates through all six bytes in the table. For all bytes except the first one, it adds a colon in front of it. If the byte represents a value smaller than 16, we ensure that the leading zero is included in the string. The bytes are added to the string in the hexadecimal format. Finally, a carriage return is added at the end of the string. Having that function in place, we can now output both MAC addresses. Let's run our code and see the result in the serial monitor. Now that the connection is established, we can display connection details one by one. We'll start with SSID of the network, then the IP address assigned to Arduino, signal strength, encryption type, and the MAC addresses of both devices. Let's raise the stakes and attempt to control a single LED connected to an Arduino remotely. Currently, my laptop is linked to my home internet and I have the Arduino Revision 4 board here. I will configure and initiate a web server on the Arduino and set it to listen on port 80. To avoid the hassle of breadboards and jumper wires, 
I'll opt for LilyPad LED, which nicely plugs into the Arduino's onboard female header pins. The cathode of the LED connects to Arduino ground, while the anode connects to Arduino pin 10. Now in the web browser, we can attempt to connect to the web server using this URL, where slash h indicates that we want to turn the LED on. The following request gets triggered from the browser to fetch a resource at the slash h path. Though such a path doesn't exist, it's treated as an input parameter instead. This request is in Hypertext Transfer Protocol version 1.1. It triggers server-side code execution, which in our case turns the LED on and generates HTML response. The response starts with HTTP status code 200, indicating the successful execution of the action, followed by the HTML code containing a message confirming that the LED has been lit. Upon receiving this response, the browser displays the HTML content. In a similar fashion, we can execute an URL with the slash L parameter prompting the LED to turn off. The HTML response is sent back to the browser to display the information that the LED is off. Now let's talk about the code we need for the Arduino. We'll require the same library as in previous example, along with the access point credentials. Next we'll define the web server, set to listen on port 80, and declare the LED pin as digital pin 10. Additionally, we'll need a string representation of the LED status, which we'll use when constructing the HTML response. By default, this variable is set to off to reflect the LED's initial state. In the setup, we'll open the serial monitor, set the LED pin as output, and establish a connection between the Arduino and the access point. For the purpose of this demonstration, I am assuming that access point will consistently assign the same IP address to the Arduino currently set as 192.168.68.128. However, this isn't always guaranteed. In the future videos, I'll address this by demonstrating how to assign a static IP address to the Arduino. As a precaution, I'll output this IP address to the serial monitor to spot when the dynamically assigned IP address changes. Finally, we can initiate the previously defined web server. Now let's move on to the loop function. Here we are constantly checking if the client has connected to the server. If a client has connected, we read the client's request until we encounter a carriage return. I am printing this request to the serial monitor so we can see exactly what the browser sent. Next, we check if the request contains the phrase slash h. If it does, we send a high signal to digital pin 10 to turn the LED on, and we update the LED status variable to on. In a similar fashion, if we detect slash L, we send a low signal to digital pin 10 to turn the LED off, and we update the string variable to off. Now it's time to construct the HTML response. We begin by sending a success code 200, followed by HTML code to be returned and displayed in the browser. After that, we can disconnect the client. Okay, so let's do the real thing. Initially, I wanted to control this onboard LED, but using LilyPad LEDs would look so much better. Let's plug it in. The code is already loaded to the board, so all we have to do is power Arduino on. In the serial monitor, you see that the connectivity has been successfully established and Arduino got IP address assigned. So now I'll take my iPhone, which is also connected to my home network and assigned IP address from the same pool, and try to connect to the web server with slash h parameter. As you can see, LED is now turned on. Strange thing though, LED was lit as soon as I typed IP address followed by slash h before I had a chance to press OK button. I am typing my request in the search field of Safari, I have already run these commands multiple times, so I think the browser tries to preview the page and turns the LED on in the process. After pressing OK, I get the anticipated HTML response. Now we can turn the LED off by running the URL with slash L parameter. Let's change the LED status once more, but this time Let's check the output in the serial monitor. After running the URL with slash h, you will see information indicating that the client has connected, along with the request issued by the browser. Once the LED status changes, web server informs about client disconnection. 
Now let's repeat the process for the slash l request. Projects like this one might not be the most thrilling, but swapping out single LED for a WS2812 matrix can suddenly make things more eye-catching. We can create a LED lamp that we can control the color of directly from the browser. In Tinkercad I create a 3D print design for such a lamp. It consists of a base to which we will mount the LED matrix and a shade that plugs in into that base, effectively diffusing the bright LED lights of the matrix. Here's the printout of the base. I will use double-sided tape to mount the matrix on it. The connection jumper wires from the matrix pins will go through those holes. Now I can plug in the shade. And it fits perfectly. The code will be nearly identical, but there are a few changes that need to be made. In addition to the Wi-Fi library, we need FastLED library for controlling WS2812 LEDs. I encountered some compatibility issues. Not all available libraries have been updated to support revision for boards. The newest version of FastLED is compatible, but the Arduino IDE didn't fully recognize it, requiring a specific installation method for it to work. If you encounter any difficulties at this stage, feel free to reach out to me for assistance. Next, there are several parameters that need to be configured for the matrix such as a pin it will be connected to, dimensions, brightness, no pixel LED type, and a table of CRGB objects corresponding to the 256 LEDs of the matrix. I won't go into the details of interfacing with the matrix here, as I have covered this extensively in several of my videos. Please check them out for more information. I will need two CRGB variables to help detect if the requested color from the browser differs from the one currently being displayed. We'll set them both to black at the start of the sketch. The part for interfacing with the single LED is now obsolete and can be removed, but we'll need a string variable to hold the text representation of the color for building the HTML response. In the setup we'll remove the lines referring to a single LED control and instead add LED matrix initialization. We will iterate through LEDs table and update the colors of all 64 LEDs to the current color variable which is initially set to black. FastLED method will display the current state of LEDs on the matrix. In the loop we will remove the section where we were checking for slash H and slash L, instead we will pass the colors as parameters. Here I am providing four if statements, but you can add more using predefined CRGB colors. When we detect the color in the HTTP request, we set new color and selected color variables to that value. When building the HTML response, we need to remove the line that was providing the updated status of the single LED and replace it with a line that provides information on the current color set for the LED matrix. At the end of the loop function, we check if the new color variable contains a color different from the one stored in the current color variable. If it does, we iterate through LEDs table again and set all LEDs to the new color. The new color then becomes the current color and we await another client request. And with that, the code is ready. Now let's connect our lamp to the Arduino. The connectivity is nearly as simple as for the single LED. The data in pin of the matrix goes to digital pin 5 and we use 5 volts and ground pins to power the matrix. Let's power up the Arduino and load the code. Now we use the browser to connect to the web server with the slash red parameter. Fantastic, the lamp looks great. Now let's try a few other colors white, green, yellow, and finally let's turn the lamp off by using slash black parameter. So this project is by no means over. The lamp cannot really be connected to the Arduino as it is right now. Let's take a closer look at the 3D print design. The base has plenty of space underneath to place the microcontroller. Instead of using Revision 4 board, which is too big and I only have one of, 
I would rather use Arduino Nano, of which I have plenty. It will need to be used with additional Wi-Fi modules, such as ESP01, of which I also have a few. It's not just the casing for this project that needs attention. Controlling LED lights from the web browser is not ideal either. So as you can see, I'm just scratching the surface. There is plenty of things you can do to improve this project. The next step would be to control such a lamp with Blink application created on your smartphone or teach Alexa to control it with voice commands. There is one more thing to address. While this web server we created in this video is accessible from my home network, it is not visible from a wider internet. To enable this, you would have to configure IP forwarding on the router so that the requests to the public address of my network over the port 80 are forwarded to the Arduino. I might do it one day. It is perfect for YouTube live session when I would invite viewers from around the world to connect and change the status of my lamp. Like those guys did, remember? But for this I would need much more followers. So for now, take care and I will see you in my next video. Ciao!